So try to answer this question. When we execute a program on a computer, where does the program reside? So write down your answer on your notebook. Now you know what to do? Swap your notebook with your neighbor. So you have to do two things. If your answers are different, you have to convince your neighbor why your answer is correct. If your answers are same, you should both discuss why that answer both of you think is correct. How many of you are convinced that your answer is correct? Raise your hands. Large number of you. All right. So you tell me what is your answer. Main memory, one answer. Okay. Anybody else who, is, who has a different yeah. Disk. Register. There is one more choice left. Anybody? All right. So, if you are convinced that a program when it is executing cannot reside on an I.O. device, not on your keyboard and on, not on your screen, that much is sure. All right. The people who said desk, so please tell me why. The program should be on the desk. All right. So go back to the Dumbo model in your mind. When we described the Dumbo, we did talk about an instruction being executed by Dumbo, but we saw what Dumbo does in response to executing that instruction. We did not talk about where does that instruction exist at the time when Dumbo is executing. We did not talk about it really. Okay. So this is sort of a fresh question. Now look at it this way. What is the program? It is a set of instructions. So it's a lot of text, for example. We presume that this text is translated into some kind of an internal machine language. So it will be a sequence of zeros and ones or whatever. But it is still a large amount of text. First of all, let us rule out registers. Because registers are really meant for holding some information temporarily which is relevant for doing a specific computation in response to a particular instruction being executed. So that cannot be the resting place for a complete program comprising of all the instructions. What about this? Indeed, the program as we write it in C++ or something in the text form will reside on the disk, just as large data may reside on the disk. But disk is an external device, just like your I.O. devices. So when Dumbo is executing the program, Dumbo can't be, can't be going to the disk, looking at one instruction, executing it, going to the disk, looking at one instruction, executing it. Dumbo, as we shall see later, is capable of reading a whole lot of data from disk, but bring it to the memory, or push a whole lot of memory, uh, data from memory and push it onto the disk. In that sense, the disk is similar to an I.O. device, except that it is not meant for interactive input-output, but for bulk input -out. So whatever Dumbo does, Dumbo has to do with its internal tools, which are a card, used only for I.O. Registers, used only for scratch pad kind of thing. Only thing that remains in memory. Now notice that so far in the Dumbo model, we said that memory is used for storing data values with names and so on. But since there is no other place accessible to Dumbo while executing the program, obviously the program itself must stay in the memory. It will not stay in the labeled names that we have for the drawers. So imagine that the mem memory is very large by then. So some memory is used by computer for storing numbers and values and characters, etc. that you give. But some part of the memory is, store, is used to store an executable program. So there are instructions, instructions, instructions. So imagine now there are 10 instructions in a program. All these instructions, first translated into its own machine language, are actually stored in some part of the memory. That's a separate part. It has nothing to do with the part which stores the data corresponding to your program. In that part, the instructions are stored. And actually, when computer executes your program, it actually goes to the memory, fetches an instruction. That instruction is decoded by the logic unit and then it is executed. While executing that instruction, 
the computer may fetch data from your data uh, storage bytes, bring it to scratchpad, do some computation, throw it back. After executing one instruction, computer will go to the next instruction stored in the same memory. Now, at this juncture, we are not very clear on how exactly those instructions will be stored. But the fact is that the instructions are also stored in a memory, in the, in the same main memory, but in a separate one. Is that clear? This is the second question. Why have registers, main memory and why not work with the cheapest? That is this. See, disk can store data, you can read or write data from it. Registers can store data, you can read, meaning you can get data into registers and put them. Memory can also store data, you can access data from memory and push data into memory. So all these three devices conceptually serve the same purpose. For the computer, the data can be pushed in and data can be pulled out. If that is so, and we have already seen that the disk is the cheapest device, storage device. Memory is far costlier and registers are still more costlier. So why, why have all that? Why not just use this? No, 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 write down the answer. Now this time it will be sentence, one or two sentences. We are all frugal people, right? We don't want to waste money unnecessarily. So economic sense tells me that this would be ideal. Sasta or Sundar. Cheap and beautiful. You have to now write why this are not suitable as the only storage device of information programs. After all, I just mentioned that your program as you write in C++ will anyway be stored in the disk. The translated program, by the way, for the first time it will be actually stored in the disk. When you execute the program, that executable program is brought from the disk into the main memory and then executed. The question is why do this jamela? Use the disk only directly for everything. Everybody has written down? All right. Now discuss with your neighbors. All right. You have discussed? So what is your answer? Somebody that side? Yeah, you tell me. So his answer is the disk is slower than the other items. And therefore if I use only disk, then my program will run very slowly. How slowly? All right. Any other answer? Yeah. He is attributing some greater flavor to a disk. He says most of the disks are only they are read-only disks, you are saying. No. We are talking about disks on which you can read, uh, from which you can read and on which you can write. So in that sense, they have exactly the same capability as registers and memory. We are not talking about CDs, not compact disks. Oh, these disks are other kinds, they are magnetic disks. So now, for this question, there is an answer which says that the disk is like a book lot of information. So it will have not only this program which is executing, but many other programs, many other things. And that is a big book. Whereas memory is like something which what you need is recently stored there. Okay. And registers are not really capable of storing large amount of So therefore memory. So that means that this therefore should be used only to store bulk information like a library. However, if I tell you that this have the capability of being accessed in a very pointed fashion, so I can actually go to a desk and say I want to read next 27 bytes from this point to this point and I can directly access it. The disk actually have that capability. So in short, the capabilities are exactly like what you have memory also, you have multiple locations and just as we said that Dumbo can go to any location and we just saw that Dumbo can go to another location which has the next instruction, well, the ALU can go to a desk to a specific location also. The conclusion is that the only reasonable and right answer is actually the speed difference. I can use this to store everything, I do use this. But reading from the desk every instruction and executing it. Execution may not take time because ALU is fast. 
but this is slow it's a mechanical device so let me expand on the example that you gave except that calling it a book i will say memory is like a piece of paper in my hand whereas disk is like a book in the physical library which is our library let's say now if you are the computer while executing an instruction what would you prefer go to library read one instruction come back execute it go to library read one instruction come back and execute it ah uh, you would like to copy all instruction on a piece of paper keep that close to you and for the fact execute one after another the instruction so that is the only reason why we do not use this only we use this we use memory we use registers in fact if speed is the criteria i want the fastest speed then what is the fastest of the three registers so ideally i should have only registers and nothing else cost so if i am rich enough or if i am willing to sell all my clothes then i can have registers but no clothes so i have some registers reasonable size of memory and a very large disk later on in your subsequent years here you will come across what we call main memory databases the memory is becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every year and therefore there are computers which have such huge memory that most of the things are stored in memory only the other problem with memory is that it is volatile power goes off all contents are lost but disk typically retains all the contents even if there is a power fail so is that clear why we don't use this all right many of you might already know binary representation and decimal representation but some of you might be seeing it for the first time but the procedure is very simple you require elementary school arithmetic division find quotient find remainder divide the quotient again find quotient find remainder keep doing that you will necessarily get ones or zeros because you are dividing by 2 the remainder will be only 0 or 1 collect all these zeros and ones in the ulta order from the bottom up and you will get the binary represent so first the quiz is the other way round given a binary representation convert it into an unsigned integer so this is a binary representation you are not converting a decimal number into binary so it is not uh, 1 lakh 1010 it is 101010 what is its equivalent in decimal number are you are supposed to calculate okay so how do you get 48 42 has everybody got 42 okay now let me ask the negative question is there somebody who could not get 42 as its value yeah so what what value did you get sorry 84 Wow. So you can you recalculate? So you have to multiply each binary digit by an appropriate power of two. What is that appropriate power? It appears to me that you have got one power extra somewhere. All right. Anybody else? So this was a bit heavy stuff, right? How many of you? have understood hexadecimal representation completely you might have heard about it earlier no okay smart i couldn't understand it if somebody explained it so quickly to me meaning i can understand what is hexadecimal i can understand what is octal but i don't think i can quickly figure out how to convert a decimal value into hexadecimal or octal quickly or vice versa but the method is not namely what is the base use that base to divide if you want to convert from decimal to hexadecimal or something find the remainder but to deal with a b c d e f as digits is not psychologically easy very fortunately 
we don't have to deal with either binary numbers or octal numbers or hexadecimal numbers when we write programs. We deal with our favorite decimal numbers most of the time. But it is important for us to understand what happens internally and this whole effort of this lecture is to tell you about what is happening internally. So just to practice a bit more on that, this is the quiz. This is a signed integer, okay? So imagine whatever was described as signed integer, what is the equivalent decimal number? 101010. There is a difference between a signed integer and two's complementary representation. In a signed integer, the most significant bit is used to represent a sign. If it is 0, it is a positive number. If it is 1, it is a negative number. The number itself comprises the remaining bits. Yeah, some people are doing it very quickly. I want each one of you to actually calculate that. So now do what we normally do. Exchange your notebook with your neighbor and check whether you got the value. All right. So let us now take a majority poll. How many people think that the value is minus 10? How many people think that the value is minus 22? So let's have argument between these two groups. These seem to be the majority of the groups. But let's analyze what it means. First of all, if this is a signed integer, then the most significant bit has to be considered to be representing the sign. If it is 0, it is plus. If it is 1, it is minus. So clearly the number is negative. So 17 or some such answer is not possible because if the most significant bit is 1, it is a negative number. Now once we know it is representing sign and once we know it is negative, we take it out. Now what remains is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. That is actually the number. The most significant bit of that number is 0. So 0, now first of all, how many bits are there in that number? 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 5 bits. There are 5 positions. So you will multiply each position starting with the least significant bit by 2 raised to 0, 2 raised to 1, 2 raised to 2, 2 raised to 3 and 2 raised to 4. 0 gets multiplied by 2 raised to 4, that is still 0. 1 gets multiplied by 2 raised to 3, how much is 2 raised to 3? 8. So you got the 1 representing 8. Next is 0 multiplied by 2 raised to 2, 0. Next is 1 multiplied by 2 raised to 1, how much is that? 2. 8 plus 2 is? 10. The last is 0 multiplied by 2 raised to 0, still 0. So what is the number now? Minus 10. No, please note the question. Okay. He says, as suggested earlier, in the two's complement method, the representation would be different. But please note what the question says. This is a signed integer. Signed integer is different from two's complement. If you interpret this number as two's complement representation, then the value will be different. But the question says, if this is a signed integer, what is the value? He is asking how do we give a command to the machine to say whether uh, do this as sign integer or treat this as two's complement, etc. Well, we don't. Every computer when it is built, when the circuits are built, the internal representation is pre-decided. If you want to deal with an independent representation, you will have to do some jinx and write some long programs. Ordinarily, most computers use two's complement. But here is a question for the purpose of our understanding of what is sign representation, what is two's complement, etc. In that context, the question is being asked. If you get sign integer, there is exactly one number which has two possible representations, and that is zero. In a signed representation, sign integer representation, only 0 can be plus 0 or minus 0. So 1 and all zeros and 0 and all zeros 
still represent 0. But every other number will have a unique representation. So minus 10 cannot be represented as a signed integer in any other way. Try to work that out. Whatever you say, write down those bits, take out the sign and convert the remaining number into decimal. You will not get 10. The capability that we are talking about is a 6-bit number. Is a 6-bit number where the first bit is sign bit. If you had a 32-bit number where you wanted to represent the same value, you would have 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the last few bits will be like this. So it is the capacity of the uh, memory location which decides how many bits will go into that represent. So this is a 6-bit number, and if you are dealing with 6-bit numbers, you will get all sequences with 0, and from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Or 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. These are the various possible numbers for a 6-bit represent. Right. Thank you.